First, I would like to acknowledge that I live, work, and play on the unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Salut with Tooth First Nations. I'm in v Vancouver, British Columbia. Great. And I uh, was up until recently living on unceded Cowichan territory, um, but I recently moved to Treaty 3, which is the traditional territory of the Ojibwe and Chippewa people, uh, currently called Kiwaitan, Ontario. Kyle Sherman is a painter currently living on Treaty 3. He holds an MFA from Emily Carr University and is a two-time recipient of the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation Painting Award. Sherman's practice is contingent on extensive travel, relying on experiential research of the Earth's diverse ecosystems and interdisciplinary collaborations with musicians and poets. His practice has included residencies with Kunstort 11 in the German Black Forest, with the Georgian Bay Land Trust in Ontario, and at the Ferry Creek Blockades on Vancouver Island. Sherman's most recent solo exhibition titled Witness was at Angel Gallery Toronto in spring 2021. Welcome, yeah. Kyle. Thank you. Yeah. Would you just start with describing your art practice and what processes and materials that you use and how does this manifest the themes in, in your work? Yeah, so I keep a pretty traditional painting practice in kind of every way you could think of it. Um, I work on wood made frames with fabric stretched over them, um, often canvas and linen, but increasingly more often jute, which is um, a really, really textured earthy fibrous material um, that I find relates really well to the subject matter. Um, but at the end of the day, I really like that oil paint is dirt and oil. That's it. It's some kind of a binder and some kind of a, a mineral or dirt that are stuck together in a tube and then we get to mush them around. Um, so something about that of the earth, about the earth kind of symbiosis that happens with landscape painting and oil painting in particular uh, it was really satisfying to me. So I try and lean into that as much as I can. Um, and increasingly, I'm painting more and more outside. I'm painting plain air, whether that's mm -hmm. sitting in the forest or sitting on my canoe, painting what's directly in front of me. Um, and then either bringing those half-finished canvases back to my studio to finish them in a more climate-controlled environment, mm -hmm. uh, finishing them outside entirely. That's kind of up to the piece. Um, but for the most part, try and keep it pretty traditional oil painting practice. Your artwork deals with the topic of deforestation, as well as honoring the beauty and the delight of the natural world. Um, how do you deal with these two kind of seemingly opposing themes in your artwork? Unfortunately, the content of the paintings has been increasingly difficult and sad. Yeah. Uh, uh, the kind of crisis that we're all facing moves past all historical norms. So it's kind of unavoidable at this point. Mm. Uh, when I was learning how to paint something about, again, that traditional oil painting practice, it was really enticing to me, the colors and shapes and forms and the materiality of it. It's, it's really, it's, for lack of a better word, it's kind of beautiful, you know, it's really seductive. Um, and I found that marrying that seductive painterly quality of making an image with that difficult content hopefully makes a bridge for some easier understanding from the point of view of a viewer. Sometimes when you're in the woods, it's not all great. I think sometimes it's, sure, it's, it's really uh, overwhelmingly beautiful and you can have these great experiences uh, interacting with the land and animals and, and plants and all different kinds of things. But it's also pretty scary sometimes um, and difficult and tiring and exhausting. And the more time that I spend outside, the more that I find that I'm using all of my senses beyond just my vision to actually interact with the land and to perceive the land in front of me, which in turn has become even more generating for, for even more generative, I should say, for, for the sake of painting in terms of color and form and, mm -hmm. and magic realism and, and subtle abstraction and everything in between. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, when when you say those things, uh, it makes perfect sense. Um, one thing that I notice about your work is that it feels it feels really modern and very current. Um, partly because you you are capturing landscape, but in a in a way that um, 
is definitely much more modern. It's not like trying to make realistic colors. Your palettes are very, they're very vivid, atmospheric, psychological. There's an emotional quality to them. Um, there can be sort of gloomy and eerie depending on uh, the sub subject of deforestation or there's a lot of characters that are alone. Um, I think, uh, we're all in the Anthropocene now, you know, there is no mm -hmm. more natural environment. There is no such thing as the wild. It doesn't exist. Every corner of earth is completely touched by the human hand now. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some of the newer paintings, and never mind the fantastical colors that can come out of painting alone in the woods at night, but also mm -hmm. some of those scenes of the bare mountainside with a bunch of discarded industry cut logs left behind, you know, th those type of really aggressive, unavoidable reminders that all land is touched by human hand at this point. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there it's, it was unavoidable, especially living on Vancouver Island, that that was going to make its way in a one-to-one -one context into the paintings. Mm -hmm. So that kind of brings me to the next question, which is, um, maybe you could just tell me what is the Ferry Creek situation um, on Vancouver Island about? The Ferry Creek watershed is the last intact watershed of its kind. And uh, currently the logging company called Teal Jones is trying to harvest the trees out of there and some of the surrounding areas. So um, Ferry Creek is on unceded Pachidot territory on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. And with the invitation of Pachidot elder Bill Jones, there has been uh, active Blockades first started out as watch camps that have now turned into uh, hard blockades since an injunction was passed. They've been going on now for just over a year. Um, I believe August 9th was the one year anniversary of those camps. And there, yeah, there's been an ongoing presence of activists and forest protectors and advocates for saving the last 1% of old growth forest on Vancouver Island and mm -hmm. less than 3% in all of BC. They've been living there and they've been not letting industry take those trees as best they can. I was invited there by a painter, uh, it was a friend of mine named Jeremy Herndl. He'd been working on starting this program with a person named Jesse Demers mm -hmm. to invite artists there. Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he said, well, come and paint. And was, yes, of course, absolutely. My work was already in pretty heavily know. rooted in that um, environmentalism and uh, logging industry in particular. So I went as an artist, uh, but I wasn't there for very long before I realized that I had a lot of other things to offer. Um, and there was a lot of other uh, cultural and community and environmental things happening that made it so that my role as a painter quickly became secondary to my role as a forest protector. Um, mm. And increasingly I became more and more involved in life at camp and the community building and infrastructure building that was associated with being there on the ground for long periods of time over the course of the spring and well into the summer. Um, so by the time that I left, I wore many hats. I certainly was a painter. I made several plein air paintings when I was out there. I definitely mm -hmm. was a forest protector um, in a direct one-to-one -one sense. I also became a member of the press for a little while where I got a press accreditation and was able to, with RCMP escort, travel um, freely behind the exclusion line documenting in, in video and photo, some of the arrests that were happening once that started. And now that I'm on the other side, I think of myself primarily as an advocate. Yeah, when I, when I got there, I think seeing the people that were participating in this in such a passionate way, you know, it was mm. genuinely, it was a little scary for me going there for the first time. I'd never yeah. participated in this. I think a lot of people would feel scared. Yeah, and coming back to some of the, just the environment stuff too, like it's scary not just because there's RCMP helicopters flying over your head mm -hmm. and there's the threat of tactical green militarized RCMP coming and abusing you in the night. You know, those things are scary. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also more cougars per square kilometer on Vancouver Island than there is anywhere else on earth. Right. And you're 65 kilometers away from the first bar of cell service. Right. And you don't really have a great way to relay information even between camps, you know? So there are a lot of things that are scary on the surface about going there mm -hmm. but the community that is there is so incredible and the conviction that the people have and the stability with which they've given themselves 
the ability to live in, in, in the woods like that for over a year now mm-hmm. is just really, really encouraging and very quickly had to become part of the content of the painting, not just the landscape itself. It's a very organized protest. It's people who really believe in these things and they're not there. They're, they're there because they're passionate about it and feel like it's, it's, it's like their last, their last recourse. Yeah. Right. And so I, I think that's, that's important for people to understand that it is very organized. One of the primary objectives there is, is saving our ancient forests. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I, I would argue that much more importantly than that is um, the, the fight for Indigenous sovereignty, in mm-hmm. particular for the Pachidot people uh, whose land is being harvested and they are being exploited financially uh, for their resources. Um, mm-hmm. I think that increasingly, uh, especially in the context of the country in which we currently live in, we have to see environmental activism and indigenous sovereignty hand in hand. Yeah, these things are connected. So Kyle, why don't you tell me about one piece that like we could take a bit of a deeper dive on one piece um, and you can just describe it and uh, let me know what you're thinking as you were making it. So the piece that I'm thinking about right away, um, it's called the, the river flowed with the blood of the forest and it's got heavy orange sky and mm-hmm. um, quite a bit of purple in the landscape on on the mountain on the back and in the background of the painting there's a stripped log riddled mountainside Um, and then in the foreground there's a forest protector standing on the edge kind of teetering on the edge of a logging bridge about to jump into the river yeah i know the one uh all the trees all the trees that are still standing around it are white so there's a lot of things that went into this painting that came from that lived experience of being at Eden Grove um, and living in the community. Mm -hmm. First was the never ending site of, of course, of industry, you know, you could always see industry. So when I was painting the logs on the hillside, I didn't just want to paint them as stumps. I wanted to paint them with really hard edges uh, to really enforce that these are industry cut logs. These aren't just fallen trees. Mm -hmm. There's human intervention here. Um, At the time I was also learning about snags, about, trees, old growth trees that naturally die and -hmm. going and visiting some of these trees in the forest and learning that when an old growth tree turns, uh, when an old growth tree naturally dies, it turns white slowly Mm -hmm. over the course of four or 500 years in some instances. Mm -hmm. And over those centuries, it slowly gives all of itself back to the nature. Animals live in the dying tree. Uh, All of its resources in terms of nutrients and stuff are broken down entirely and given back to the soil and all other plants. Mm -hmm. Um, It takes four or 500 years, but when industry cuts a tree and leaves it alone on the hillside, sometimes it only takes a couple seasons for that Mm -hmm. to happen. So I started to see um, an aesthetic kind of uh, value in terms of reading the narrative through these paintings and painting the living trees and the dead trees both white. So this is in that painting that was the first time that I did that. Your art is actually like you like your show is called it is a witness to to these events and you're you're depicting them in a, in a, a deeper um, you know time-based way that is like fully encapsulating like the emotional physical um, and kind of almost spiritual experience of that. Of, that, of those um, events, this event that's happening right now. Yeah, I'm trying to find ways to to bridge the human narratives and, and the ecological narratives that are happening out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as a result of being on the ground, of actually physically being there making this work, the paintings themselves, the actual object of the paintings, become tools um, in the spirit of advocacy. Mm-hmm. In this painting that I'm talking about in particular, the river flowed with the blood of the forest. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a day, it was about three quarters done. It was pretty close to being done. And I was making breakfast in the morning. We were taking things out of the tent. I had, I had it propped up against my truck out of the studio tent where we would paint if it would rain too hard or whatever we needed. And all of a sudden a runner comes up the, the hill to where the studio tent was yelling, industry, industry, industry. And that was the first time that that happened when I was out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and all of a sudden I don't know maybe 10 or 12 industry guys come up the hill there's a whole bunch of cameras pointed at us Um, there's our media liaison and our police liaison and they're all just standing there in front of the painting looking at the painting 
and looking at me and looking at the painting and looking at me. And in the moment, I knew that their job was to read me the entirety of the injunction. They were supposed to stand there and read all of the words in the three or four page document to me that explained to me how um, being off to the side of a road on the logging road, painting was somehow in violation of the BC Supreme Court's injunction. Um, now I can't say for certain because I wasn't the person reading the paper, but the person who was reading the injunction, a representative of Teal Jones, they couldn't really do it. Mm -hmm. In my mind, they kept looking at the painting and then they would look at me and then they look at the painting and then they'd look at me. And he only made it through about the first paragraph mm -hmm. before he just stopped and he stared at the paper. And one of the other guys that was with him, who was looking at the painting, he said, that's a nice painting. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then he said, maybe you should find some less contentious land to paint on. And he totally missed the irony of his statement in that moment. Yeah. Um, and then they just handed me the paper <clears> and <throat> they all walked back down the hill. You know, in these, in these situations where you have these um, opposing forces and ideas coming, coming to out like and playing out in dramatic real time, it's like, can we not just stop and look at the poetics of our world and our lives in a big picture way? Yeah, I think that um, especially painting and the way in which it can blur reality and, mm -hmm. and, and the truth and wishful thinking and everything in between and uncertainty, you know, it can kind of be all those things at once. I think it can give a lens to, to a different kind of truth. Um, and it takes, it takes a, a moment to see sometimes, you know, that like sometimes the fantastical colors and, and the easy compositions, I think that those are a useful trick to get somebody to, to be enticed to want to look more. And after they've looked for 10 mm -hmm. seconds, 30 seconds, a minute, then they realize the logs on the hillside and the mm -hmm. stumps and the trees on fire. And hopefully in that moment, they might think to themselves, there's got to be, there's got to be something more here. There's got to be a way in which I can help stop this because it's happening all around us. You know, we consume art we see art uh, or, you know, we see a situation and it takes us time to process it. So you can, some, it's like teaching, you never know exactly how much you have affected somebody or, um, or even in our interactions with each other, we don't know how long these things will take to or affect another person, but they do, you know? And that's why it's, that's why we are compelled to make art, have conversations, and do these things because we believe that eventually they'll have some kind of big picture effect on the way, you know, our decisions and how we learn and grow as humans. It felt good knowing like once the work made, some of the work made its way to Angel Gallery in particular in Toronto, it felt good knowing that there's like a big influx of donations to both the Eden Grove oh, residency wow. program and to Ferry Creek. Like, it's nice. like, okay, obviously some people are looking with intent and asking questions Tell me about the the pleasures and sorrows of painting outside. Like you're painting out in the bush. You've already kind of described it, um, but you know, like there's mosquitoes and black flies and um, there's- Cougars. A, why is it firstly kind of, how does it inform your work and um, what do you enjoy about it? I think the best way to talk through this for me is, is um, by talking about the work that I do sitting on my canoe. I paint on my canoe a lot. I've got a pretty good little oil painting setup that I can take out on the water with me now. Um, and it's it's really a uh, unique experience for painting because I'm in constant collaboration with the environment when I'm on my canoe. Mm -hmm. I might start looking straight ahead into the woods and I'll start drawing a tree or something on the shoreline and I'll look at the canvas for a moment or two and maybe I'll put some paint on there. And then I look up and the canoe's already shifted a bit. You know, the wind and the current has already pushed me a little bit. So when I look up again, I'm looking at something different. Yeah. And that's going to inform the painting. Um, I was mentioning earlier about relying on non-visual sensory information to inform some of my aesthetic yeah, decisions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about and that. And I think that that's kind of the best, the best example. You know, like I, 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 been reading so much over the last few years about mycorrhizal networks and Suzanne Samard's work and Paul Stamets work and read The Hidden Life of Trees and Robert Wall Kimmer. You know, there's all these new interesting ways in which people are considering science and, and the land and how trees and, and, and ecology is all connected and communicating and sharing. And when I'm in the woods, even if I'm out on my canoe painting, I like to think that maybe I can be an antenna for some of that extra 
sensory information that's emanating out of everything around us. And how can I use that to inform my aesthetic decisions? Well, that changes every day. Um, that might be color or form or shape or, or all three of those things. I'm not really sure, but um, yeah, the, the, the unexpectedness that comes from painting like that, whether it's on the water or in the woods is, is what keeps me going back for more. Love it. it those are the things that um, sometimes that get sort of muted when you're in the city. Assign us a short project to get us thinking about painting or art that is influenced by your practice that has uh, activist bent. Okay, so there's two things, kind of a two part project, if that's okay, um, that I've been thinking about in response to this, mm -hmm. um, that both involve direct interaction with the land. Mm -hmm. So the first part of the assignment would be to make a non destructive land or ecology sculpture of some kind. That would be something as easy as maybe making an arrangement of rocks in a pattern or, or sticks or leaves, or maybe making a drawing in sand or dirt that might be around you. Mm -hmm. Starting with that sculpture that you've made and then drawing it or painting it. This could just be a small sketch or, or a bigger painting if you wish, but having that kind of two-step interaction with the land around you. Um, mm -hmm. So basically go outside, create your sculpture, document it, then maybe bring it back to the studio, do it there or document yeah. it and bring it back to your studio and turn it into something else. Yeah, a drawing or a painting of your little land sculpture or a big land sculpture if you feel so inclined. Right. Yeah. Take a, maybe also take a look at Andy Goldsworthy's work. He does that a lot. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Cool. Or. Um, Sarah Jean Bourget is another artist that I think of, and she uh, makes her own charcoal and then makes drawings of trees with charcoal that she made. That's a pretty cool one. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. And then what's the second one? The second one is um, to use some kind of um, natural made pigment that you've made yourself. And that could be, again, like I just mentioned, Sarah's work. Um, maybe you want to take a piece of charred wood out of your fire pit and make a drawing out of it. Or you want to take some berries that you found along the trail and squish them in your fingers and turn them into a pigment and mm -hmm. make a drawing. Turmeric is amazing for that. Turmeric's another good one. Um, even just grass, everybody's got access to grass. You yeah. know, you have grass stains on your knees. You can, mm -hmm. you can kind of mush up grass and make a pretty easy pigment out of that. Um, mm -hmm. But again, just to stress that kind of that, again, that symbiosis between the land and art making and yourself and how all those things can can be intertwined, I think, is is the best way to get thinking about this assignment. OK, so the assignment essentially at its core is to get us working with the land around us, um, creating and thinking about the shapes and forms that we see and um, and having and and kind of observing probably looking deeply at where we are in place. Yes, very much so. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Kyle, where can we find you online? Um, my website is my full name.com, kylesherman.com. And uh, Instagram is the best place. Instagram is like a little bit more of a what's happening lately, what's new and fresh in the studio, where have I been traveling, where have I been painting. So Instagram. Okay. For sure. Sounds great. Well, thank you very much for talking to us about the Fairy Creek situation and your practice. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Great. Me too. Okay, cool.